they looked at me and changed the channel on the TV and she was still crying. He called me a tough little shit and threw me into the door. She screamed so he opened the door and threw me in too. It was dark, but she held me after I fell to the floor and slept for a while. As she passed the door, let her hand touch its handle and linger. His eyes stopped following her and gazed intently at that handle. He understood there were options, that he could walk back through that door, and if not, if it had been locked, he could make it open. That he could make that door open and stand and be noticed and not in the dark. But then he worried. His heart raced a little, and as he looked at that greening copper knob, he saw behind it, through the keyhole beneath and into the next room, and into his father's face. That face was laughing, but not happy. And it wouldn't even be laughing if he did what he knew he could. It would all happen again, and then maybe his sister was right. Maybe he wouldn't be able to get back up. He would much like that, he thought, and looked through the keyhole at his father, unmoving from the center of the room, thinking that he would much like his father to go farther than he had before, because then someone would notice. Someone would have to notice a missing child, because children are missed. His sister would miss him most, though. What could she do? What could she think? Would she be proud? He wouldn't feel proud, because then she would be alone, and he would have at her as well. And there wouldn't be him to take half of it, and there wouldn't be anyone to hold each other if there was only her, and now her arm. He didn't think he offered much of anything to her, but she would hold him and comfort him to comfort herself. And that made everything they suffered worth it to her. He stared at the door, and once more he let his jaw drop in a gape of simplicity, seeing the lights flicker beyond the keyhole and seeing his father's face smiling and laughing, though not happy. He'd come home as usual, and the children had just returned from school themselves a few minutes before. He opened the door, and they were unpacking their things on the table. Mother was gone. They missed her, but the three of them did what they had to. Father never said much, and he walked past them, dropping his things on the table on top of theirs. They took his things and put them in place on the counter. The son took his briefcase and set it on its side so the daughter could place the notebook and a few papers on top. The two looked and smiled at each other, and they sat on the kitchen table and made lunch. The phone rang in the living room, and they ate their lunch and listened to Father talk. His voice was a bit gruff, and he was always stern, and it sounded contemplative and yet simple. He was always thinking about when he could, about the next time. The brother and sister looked at each other, and they knew without saying. They bit into their food and savored it. Father walked through the kitchen, opened the refrigerator, and took out a can. The snap was penetrating, and she flinched. Her brother saw it and frowned, but Father gulped the cold thing in typical brusqueness. His shoulders relaxed, as did his guys. He, he still smiled, but Sis spoke up. Daddy, you having friends again tonight? Father simply nodded, belched, and walked into the other room. He turned on the television, and they all got to hear the news. Go to our room, Sis? Yeah, I don't like Father's friends much. Yeah. It's what you want to do. Gotta be quiet, Sis. Yeah, I know, but what you want to do? We can do things. No, I'm tired. How you old is this? Classes were okay. The teacher liked my paper. She grinned and blushed. What about yours? I'm tired. Then they walked through the living room towards their haven. Father had his legs propped up and glared at them as they passed and wouldn't have it so silently, bellowing, Get this place cleaned up! You'd have thought you were pigs leaving this place all the rubbish! He pointed sternly at a pile of cans, his cans in the corner of the room, and at the spills and burn marks around the floor and the little pong balls the kids used to play with until he'd start yelling at them. He didn't like them to get too dirty. They were putting the cans in a bag and getting out the rags when his friends arrived, and they were already in the mood. They liked coming to Father's house, and other houses like Father's, and all the houses smelled the same. They, they smelled the other houses. Get that door. Can't you do things right for a change? You think you'd both be used to it by now. The place is still wrecked. Get out of my way. I'll get the door. Father pushed the children towards the wall, and Sis held onto the bag of cans, and the brother let the, held the rags close and looked about himself uncertainly. She was crying again, a bit, and that worried him. It wasn't good when Sis cried, and that was something he knew. He handed her a rag and pointed to her face, and when she started rubbing the table, started rubbing the table where something had spilled, she rubbed her eyes, and it burned a little, but her face was cleaner, and that was really all that mattered. She tied off the bag, and Father's friends came in. They came in and handed him a different bag. It was small and dark on the inside, and the children saw it and were happy. Father was calm when he had bags like those. It was different when he drank cans, and that was good for them. 
They handed him the bag and walked over to the table to set up. And then the third friend came in with more cans, more and more cans. And then Sis couldn't take any more and cried again because the burning in the cans got to her and that was all she could take. Her brother could only think these things, try to figure them out, knowing what would happen, but not how, nor when, nor really exactly what. Sis was crying, and Father saw this time, and he shut the door softly, looking outside, up and down the street, and crept back rather secretly. He was always worried when his friends came over, but the children didn't understand. Their faces met, and he saw her tears. Father wasn't over towards her. You know, father walked over towards her and walked, asked what was wrong, but he knew. He was smiling, but he really wasn't. She didn't answer him and started to move towards the door and throw out the cans. She really hated the cans, and this was her job, and she always threw out the cans. So he smacked her and asked, What's wrong, kid? She cried some more and stopped moving. He smacked her again when she stopped moving and didn't answer him, and this time she whined a bit. She was thinking about her brother, how Bro was wiping down the table, and Father's friends were at the same table and laughing at him, but Bro wasn't at the table anymore. He was looking at her and Father, seeing into her teary face and seeing into Father's smile, back and forth and back, so dumb. They were drinking in blaze with the smoke. I miss Mommy. He hit her, hard, and she started to fall. Father wrapped his fingers around her braids, fraying apart with her disorientation. The sensation became her and she nearly fainted fell and would have fell to the ground had he not grabbed her more, twisting another hand within the collar of her shirt and pulling her up. Sister had tried to speak up, speak out, but now she couldn't do that anymore, and he carried her limp form across the room where he wouldn't have to see her anymore. Father didn't like to see miserable things, he said often. They approached the big door, solid and formidable, and he let her head limp down and opened it softly. It came too silently as he wished her to be, and threw her into its darkness, through the threshold of his consciousness, and didn't have to watch her body land. She crumpled on the floor, the blood dropping on the floor, as she went through the air, and she fell on herself, and there was a snap. But the television was on and loud, and they were loud, and he didn't have to hear it. Father didn't have to watch it. She was on the floor, but it didn't matter. Softly, he closed the door, and the click of the latch was fatal. Her brother looked at the handle as his hand left it behind, and father could tell his son was upset, so he looked at him and asked, What? You going to get tough with me, boy? He smirked and walked towards his friends, grabbing a beer on the way and cheering another on as he chugged away, the long tube draining into him, and the three senses draining out. Laughter echoed through the boy's head as his blood rushed up, flushed his face red, and his eyes went red, and he saw his father's face. He glared, and his father continued smirking, and would look at him in the corner of his eye until he turned to face him. What, boy? What are you going to do, cry over there? Get on, boy, he yelled at his son, who was fuming at the side of the room, thinking about his sister. His father stepped over towards him with a grin, looking over his shoulder at his friends. The tube was still placed in one's mouth, but he was on the floor, and the other was just kind of laughing, though kind of vomiting, about to fall over too. The third was just standing, leaning drunk against the wall, and slowly raising his beard to his mouth, drizzling it over his teeth. The father came, some of it falling from his menacing lips, sneering at the boy, grinning at the boy. She was awake again, and she hit the door over and again. Wanting out, worrying for her brother, she screamed out, Don't! Don't! Daddy! Don't! But he came at her brother anyway, and her brother heard and he teared. He thought about that snap, about what happened, and about what father was going to do with him now. He stood there waiting for it, and his mouth was wrenched down in a scowl. Now what? You gonna cry, boy? Father cornered his son, smiling with it all. And the boy let himself be moved into a corner because he knew what would happen then, at least. His father moved towards him and hit him again, across the face and busting his lip. And again, but this time his ear was busted and a ring overcame things. As he stood there, big and dumb in the corner, the ring faded in and out and father was talking again. Oh, ain't you a tough kid? You can take a punch. And he looked over at his friends who were all cheering and laughing. Yeah, you'll take it, because you're such a strong boy, you little brat. He placed his hands over his son's shoulders, pressed back and shoved him into the corner. Father put a finger in the boy's face and poked him idly, firmly, jabbing him repeatedly and mouthing things the boy couldn't hear. Insults, corrections, you shoulda, coulda, but didn't. The son looked towards the door and heard his sister crying and doubled over quickly. 
Don't you worry about her, boy, father said, though he wasn't heard. And as the son tried to breathe, opened his mouth, father took his thumb and shoved it in. Father took his hand and palmed his son's face, tearing the roof of his mouth with his trimmed thumbnail and gripping about the nose and around the cheeks with his four powerful fingers. He dragged his son towards the television because he wanted to watch the news. The news is a good thing, he said to his friends, and made his son watch by setting his son's head on the table in front of it. Father had a habit of drumming his fingers. Holding his son didn't pause this habit at all, and so there was no watching the news, and he was very uncomfortable. He bit down.